Yes, uh, thanks, Robbie, and thanks everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, as we kick off the 2020 regular season, it feels like the 2019 season ended about three years ago uh, at this point. Uh, but uh, 2019 was a very special year for our organization and for Titans fans. Uh, it started off with the 2019 NFL draft in downtown Nashville, which by uh, any measure was the, uh, the best draft in the history of the NFL and ended with a magical run to the AFC championship. Uh, of course, about a month after uh, the, the AFC championship, our organization found itself uh, deploying into North Nashville and other communities around Tennessee to, to help our, our neighbors dig out their homes and, and businesses from uh, the devastating tornado. And within about a week after that, our offices were closed for a, a period of about two months. And, uh, but it's, it has been a, an unusual and a challenging off season, but our, our leadership team is, is just so proud of the work that, that our team has done uh, during that time. Uh, really first class work, uh, whether it's standing up a remote workforce over the course of a weekend to, to setting up a virtual draft over the course of April uh, to more recently uh, getting St. Thomas Sports Park and Nissan Stadium ready for a healthy and safe reentry for our players and staff. And in the case of Nissan Stadium, uh, hopefully uh, getting it prepared for the, the safe reentry of fans at some point later this season. Uh, but uh, there's no question we're thrilled to, to finally be uh, paying attention to something that feels very normal and, and exciting, which is uh, Titans football uh, when they put the ball down on, on Monday night. Uh, with that, I'll kick it over to Gil. Yeah, it's great to be with you guys today. I haven't seen some of you in a while. Um, and it's a great time to be a Titan, as Burke just kind of laid out. Um, excited because you know we have a ton of momentum with our fans coming out of last year's playoff run and we've seen that reflected in the enthusiasm and anticipation for the start of this season. Um, as you all know we're not able to start this year the way we would have liked um, with the full impact Nissan Stadium um, but we have a number of fun things planned for our fans um, starting with Nissan kickoff week which launched yesterday and I'm sure we'll get to that in a bit. Um, that will open up the questions. Uh, John Glenn. Sure. I, th I think this might be more of a guilt question, but, but whichever one feels better about answering is fine with me or both. Um, wondering if you guys can talk about um, the, uh, the process of trying to create a home field advantage in, in this particular year where at least you're starting out with no fans and, and maybe uh, in particular uh, also touch upon the, the kind of the crowd noise um, that, uh, that has to be, you know, brought into that, that situation and how that's done. Yeah, I guess that would be more for me. Um, that, that's a tough one, John, because there's only so much we can do in this environment in terms of, you know, how we can attack the in-game um, environment with no fans. Um, but we will be running something of a norm, quote unquote normal um, show in terms of this in-stadium elements um, with the music and introductions and things that hopefully will help fire up our team. Um, we also have done a program where fans will be able to, um, quote unquote, buy uh, cutouts of themselves that will appear in one of the end zones, um, which will have the, you know, at least if you, if you can't be there in body, you can be there in spirit. So people's images and photos will be there on cutouts there. And then last but not least, um, if you remember last year, uh, the bunting or the signage around the inner ring of the lower bowl um, was uh, dedicated towards uh, Steve McNair and Eddie George in honor of their um, Jersey retirements. Um, this year, though, that area is gonna be focused on celebrating our founders and our biggest fans. Um, so, you know, if nothing else, our players will be surrounded by friendly faces um, as they play. Sure, maybe just one quick follow again for, for either one, whichever wants to answer. Just a, a little bit, if, if someone could talk about the challenge of kind of marketing and, and ticketing in, in this year where potentially you know, uh, could be very, very small crowds, maybe no crowds uh, for, for a whole season. Sure, I guess that's for me as well. Um, so on the marketing side, in terms of fan engagement, you know, even before the pandemic and the situation we found us, what we find ourselves into now, um, you know, our goal is to build a 24-7, 365 relationship with all of our fans. Now, obviously, you know, the, the game experience is the, the crown jewel of that. It's a big part of that. And then that, that will be missing for now. Hopefully that changes. Um, but the vast majority of our interactions um, with our fans happened away from the building. And now we'll have to focus even more on that. 
um, whether it's digital platforms. Um, you know, we're launching, um, some of you may have seen, we started to launch our new Tennessee Tough uh, marketing and ad creative, which is meant to really capture the spirit and resilience of this region as, a, as well as the spirit of our team. Um, and we're hoping that our fans relate to that, feel inspired and, and see themselves reflected in that, in our brand and spirit um, around that. And then things like I mentioned earlier, like kickoff week, um, Nissan kickoff week, which we started yesterday with hosting five happy hours around um, Nashville and, and the suburbs. Um, we're handing out over 15,000 Tennessee tough yard signs. Um, there'll be a couple of show, drive-in showings of uh, Remember the Titans. We're having a pop-up shop where we're selling uh, kind, of, kind of cool kids clothes uh, for Titans fans that might be a little bit hipper than, than myself or Burke or the rest of us on this phone, except for Buck, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then finally, we'll have our Titans Hangout series, um, which is going to be a series of watch parties for Monday's big games um, or big game. Those are the things we've announced so far, but there'll be a couple of other surprises along the way. But I guess at the end of the day, John, you know, we're, we're trying to pull the levers that we still have access to um, to engage with our fans. And you know, these are things that we would be doing, we'd want to be doing anyway, but they just become that much more important and we're having to be that much more creative without the game experience. The only thing that I would add is I think, I think the marketing teams work in, in this respect as an example of, of, of how this is some of the best work that I feel like this organization has ever put out uh, in these challenging times. They're using the, the challenge as an opportunity to, to, to be more creative and innovative. And, and I, I think our organization is not just this season, but, but in future seasons when hopefully the world is a bit more back to normal, uh, will benefit from, from the work that's, that's happening in this off season. Uh, Steve Lehman. Yeah, I think this probably goes for Burke. And thanks for doing this this morning, guys. I guess my biggest question is we've heard a lot about the stuff that's gone into the, the practice facility and locker room and, and all the arrangements for the players to make sure they're safe this season. What has been the biggest challenge of getting set for Nissan Stadium to put on a game day, eventually maybe with some fans? And are you anticipating at this point, given recent numbers, that maybe you'll see fans in October? Uh, thanks, Steve. Well, I, first, I would say the, to, to, to get to the, the punch, there's, there's no breaking news here today, certainly. We, we remain hopeful and, and ready to, to host fans if, if we are to, to uh, get that opportunity. Uh, that's really a question for the mayor's office. And, and we respect the mayor's decision and trust the mayor's decision. Uh, as he said uh, last week, this is a national response, not a Nashville response in, in terms of uh, being slow about reopening facilities like our venue. Uh, that said, uh, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth or in the mouth of his health department, but I, I think that they would agree with us that we believe that, that the Titans game day experience that we have uh, put forth in our safe stadium plan uh, is, is first class and uh, it would allow us to safely host fans uh, if we were to be given the opportunity. Uh, I genuinely believe that going to a Titans game this fall may be one of the safest things that, that could happen, you know, in a vacuum of what would happen within our four walls. There are just many more things that the mayor needs to be considering and the health department needs to be considering uh, when green lighting uh, thousands of people traveling, uh, in many cases from other regions, to, to, to come to one of our games. But uh, has it been a challenge? Sure, it's been a challenge, but it's one that we, we started to work on uh, back in, in March or April, recognizing that this was very likely where, uh, where the season would open up in, in terms of the pandemic. And we have had a team of uh, cross-functional team of just about every organization uh, in, in our club, uh, as well as uh, health experts from around Nashville, and in some cases, international health experts. Our vendors have participated in, in those phone calls. We've met uh, weekly as a big group, and uh, we've met in subgroups, uh, you know, multiple times every week uh, to be sure that we kind of looked into every nook and cranny of things that we could do to, to reopen safely for our fans. And, and we're confident that if given the opportunity, uh, we'll be able to deliver on that. Uh, Gentry? I guess also for, for Burke, um, do you have any kind of timetable on when you might know about the games in October? And have you modeled very many percentages, 20%, 25%, that kind of thing in terms of number of fans? Yeah, it's a great question, Gentry. So uh, I, 
let me put it this way. I was playing phone tag with the mayor's office this morning and uh, and then plan to hopefully connect this afternoon. We're 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 actively engaged. We're we're, we're having conversations. Uh, I do think there's reason for hope for October, but uh, very preliminary uh, to, to, to be thinking about uh, whether or not um, uh, we'll ultimately get that green light. There's some operational needs that if, if for October 4th, uh, if we don't know probably within the next seven to 10 days, it would just make it difficult to, to ultimately uh, deliver tickets and, and get people into the stadium. So hopefully uh, there's, there's word one way or the other uh, over the next you know, four or five, six days. Uh, in, in terms of percentages, uh, yes, we have some percentages in mind, but I, I think the, the key is it, it doesn't start with the percentage gentry. It starts with what is safe and, and what is safe in our mind in an outdoor stadium uh, with everyone wearing face masks uh, is, is kind of this table, uh, this restaurant table uh, pod based seating of, of one to six fans that are socially distanced from every other uh, pod of fans. And, and then we just work backwards to what that works out uh, in terms of a stadium manifest. And it, it works out to about 21, 22% uh, if, if we were to, to activate the entire stadium uh, with that capacity. Uh, but there's, we also, we're, we're trying to be creative and we have other configurations that would even be less than that, that, that would still be worth, worth the while of our opening and, and getting some fans in the door to enjoy a Titans game. Uh, Paul? Hi, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, the chance to chat. Wondering uh, if the circumstances have dictated any layoffs or furloughs within the organization. Uh, no, no, sir, Paul. I, I, think, I think everyone who, uh, I think Nashville as a whole appreciates Amy Adams Strunk, uh, but those of us who work in the organization who get to work with her firsthand and, and, and see her generosity uh, have a special appreciation for her. Uh, we have not undertaken furloughs or layoffs. And in fact, uh, she's, she's invested in our employees uh, during, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, for those of you who've been out to the facility, you've seen uh, the, the headquarters expansion has, has stayed on track. Uh, we invested in uh, the technology that was necessary to, to set up and work remotely. Um, the, the, the health and safety uh, protocols have required heavy investment uh, for the players and we've extended those to staff areas as well. Um, and, and in fact, uh, not only have we not had furloughs or layoffs, she's actually invested in, in new headcount uh, where, where it was necessary. Uh, we've, we've brought on Adolfo Birch uh, as chief legal officer, uh, Surf Melendez as our new creative director, uh, Dan Worley as our new general counsel. Uh, and in every case, uh, they are quite literally best of class in the sports industry. Uh, which, which I, I think indicates that the Titans have become something of a destination club uh, in the sports industry. So no, 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 no furloughs or layoffs. And if anything, she's invested. Also wondering how you did on the initial opt out uh, for season ticket holders. I know there's a, another opportunity for them if and when you're allowed to have people. So uh, we're not going to throw out specific numbers, Paul, but what, what I would tell you is that we're tracking along, you know, pretty much with the league average. We're, we're, we're doing a little bit better in the sense that we've had fewer people opt out than what the league average is. Thanks. Uh, Buck? Hey, guys. Appreciate you doing this today. Um, with two things, I guess. First and foremost, you guys have been really strong about getting out in front as an organization um, in the in taking a stance against police brutality and supporting the African American community, how important was that to you guys as an organization and, and as individuals? Yeah, uh, thanks, Buck. I, I, you know, going back to to June, there were organizations, you know, all over the world that were rightfully issuing statements, and and we took some time to to write a statement uh, that was was short and to the point but could serve as something of a mission statement for organization on issues of, of racial equality and social injustice. Um, and it's, it's that we reject racism in, in every form and are committed to being a part of the generation that ends it. And uh, it's, it's, it's something that is, uh, it's, it's an evergreen commitment that, that we're making to, to the community. Uh, we, we see that we have a, a platform and in some cases, we have leverage to, to move the needle uh, in our community. 
uh, on important issues, and, and, and clearly this is this is one. Uh, and I, I, I would like to kick it over to, to Gil, uh, if you don't mind, Gil, maybe giving some specific examples of because um, while while words are are are, are of a certain importance. Um, we also uh, understand that that action needs to back those words, and so we've been committed as an organization to to to, to putting those words into action. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to note that you know, obviously, 2020 has brought a lot of these social justice and equality and anti-racism concepts and issues to the fore. But really, Amy, through, with Amy's leadership, we've been doing our part or trying to do our part um, for a while there in terms of addressing these issues. And, you know, things like the grants that Amy did last year with over six figures going to the NAACP's uh, Freedom Fund, for example, and a number of other nonprofits that were geared towards equality and social justice issues um, is a great example of that. Um, you know, this year with it being an election year, um, we have really leaned into voter registration as an opportunity to really, you know, rally the community and have their voices heard on a nonpartisan basis, regardless of what your beliefs or, or you know, um, where you sit on the, the blue red continuum. It's really about just making sure that everybody's voices are heard and represented. And to that end, we've done um, several PSAs um, involving our players and coaches. Um, we have partnered with the I Am a Voter um, organization, which is really designed for people to be able to have easy access to what their, um, that, what their situation is. Are you registered? Are you not? Where are the nearest polls? And to be able to access all that via text. Um, and then another thing we're getting off the ground in the coming uh, weeks is the Real Conversations with Titans programs, um, which is really geared towards the next generation. Um, you know, through internal conversations with Burke, uh, through Vrabel and, and Robinson, you know, we've really, you know, come up with, the, you know, not, not the, the brainstorm, but really the notion that it's hard to hate when you know people, when you've been able to expose to people. A lot of times the hatred and the racism and things of that nature are really rooted in, in ignorance and not having been around folks. And so we really want to have to take the opportunity to address the younger generation and kids and expose them to our players um, of all races and that really engage in conversations, you know, about the issues that are happening out there right now. Um, and then I think the other important thing, part of Buck's question is, you know, from an individual standpoint, you know, I, I felt both, um, you know, supported from day one here. Um, I think the environment within the Titans organization is very progressive in the sense of, you know, Everyone's treated well. We take all issues around identity very seriously, whether it's racial, gender, um, whatever. And I think it's a very positive and, um, you know, frankly, inspiring uh, uh, culture, you know, again, led by Amy Adamstrong. If I could follow up on that, you mentioned t focusing on the younger generations. That's also something that Mike, Mike Rabel has spoken to us about as well. You guys have done a couple different things, certainly on the marketing side, to try and engage a, a younger fan base, a younger NFL fan to try and get them involved with the Titans because given that there's so many transplants coming in from Nashville, um, how have you seen, how have you seen people in that demographic that you're targeting respond to those things that you guys are doing? Um, I'll take that. So, uh, you know, it's early days, Buck, you know, in the sense of, you know, Last year, we, we, we set that as a priority to kind of find, you know, what are the intersections between, you know, the culture involving, you know, whatever, you know, buzzword you want to use, millennials, Generation Z, what have you, but what are their interests and then what are the intersections between their interests and, and what the Titans do. And anecdotally, I can tell you that it's paying off. You, you see people recognizing us as being a more exciting brand, as having cooler events and being and doing different things. And you know, approaching the marketplace in a different way. Um, we're still at the beginning of sort of the quantitative piece of that and sort of, you know, I can't tell you that our fandom of amongst 25 to 34 has gone up X percent yet, um, but we are doing that work behind the scenes and hopefully we'll be able to have a really cool story going forward. But I can tell you that I've had multiple people kind of approach us and sort of say they see the difference over the last, you know, 12 to 24 months. And you know, again, it really starts with the investment that the team has been put forth and, and Amy's leadership in that regard. Thanks, and, and Buck, I would say I've got a, I've got a test market of three uh, with, uh, I've got a, a high school daughter and a middle school boy and an elementary school boy. And it's, it's really hard to describe the difference that I've seen among their friend base and at their schools 
over the last two years. Uh, one of the, the most impressive things that, that, that I saw last year uh, at a Franklin basketball game, they, they've got a, a rowdy uh, student section and at one of their basketball games, they, they had a Titans themed night and it, it was hundreds of kids wearing Titans jerseys and, and, and Titan shirts. And I don't think that happens two or three years ago. We've got probably five or six minutes left. Try to run through the rest of these. Uh, Chris Harris. Hey, yeah, my, my question was just to follow up to Gil about the cutouts. Um, I, Cause I've already gotten like five questions in the last five minutes since you mentioned that. Um, how much does those cost and where will the money go to for fans that purchase that? Um, I'm going to apologize. So I don't have those price points in front of me. Um, and the, we're already off sale um, because they had to go into production. Um, so we're, we're not able to sell them, but the, the, at this point, but the money will go to the Titans foundation and, and then be funneled through to the various causes and interests uh, um, that we put out there from a nonprofit perspective. Uh, Terry McCormick. In terms of fans not being allowed into the stadium, obviously for the season opener, how much is the league allowing you in, re in regards to artificial crowd noise and what's, what's acceptable and what's not going to be acceptable for that? It's, it's actually a, a league mandate, Terry. Uh, the, the league is providing audio uh, for us to, to run through the, our, our production studio uh, at the stadium and is, is very specific in terms of the decibel levels and, and that sort of thing. So the, the league is providing uh, the, the, the curated audio for us. And last one, uh, Teresa. Uh, I'm not sure if this is for Burke or Gill, but uh, on the Black National Anthem, Lift Every Voice, uh, is that going to be re live, recorded? And as far as uh, any decisions on what the players might be doing, is that being left to the players themselves if they choose to uh, make any kind of uh, protest or, or anything like that? Uh, in terms of your first question, Teresa, that would be a, a, a national television broadcast question, and I frankly don't know the answer to it. Uh, in terms of your second, absolutely, the, 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 we will support the players, and, uh, and, and uh, it is, is being left up to them. Yeah, in, in terms of the Black National Anthem, it's, it's important to note that that is a league initiative for week one. And it's not necessarily something that will, you know, be a, um, an ongoing thing necessarily, but we're still kind of making our plans as to what we may or may not do. So, um, you know, that might be something that could be on the table for us as well. But as of right now, that's really something that's special for kickoff week. Actually, I lied. I have one more. Uh, Paul had a follow-up. Thanks, Robbie. Um, guys, there's a loud segment of your fan base, uh, at least on social media, that makes it clear it does not care to hear uh, what your players think on social issues and uh, is determined not to pay attention to the organization as long as, as the players are expressing those things. I'm just curious what kind of the organizational philosophy is with regard to that segment of your would-be fan base. Uh, well, Paul, I would go back to our, our mission statement, uh, which is we reject racism in all forms and are committed to being a part of the generation that ends it. So the, the, the conversations that our players are, are initiating in our community, uh, we not only support those conversations uh, or they're starting those conversations, we're, we're proud of them for, for starting those conversations and using their platform uh, in that way. So uh, to, to answer your question, I would just encourage uh, those fans to, to genuinely listen to, to the, uh, the, the issues that our, our players are, are, are trying to, to highlight.